Hello! This is a tutorial for the Sony PXW X70 camcorder and Manfrotto MV500 tripod. If set up correctly, you can produce some very nice images with this camera. Here are some now. Every time you get a Sony 70 from the store, you'll get it in a nice black rucksack. Let's see what's in the bag in the usual kit. So now we've unzipped the bag, this is everything that's in it. We've got the camera itself, we've got the charger, we've got a large battery and a small battery. Always start with a large battery, it'll last longer. XLR cable, pistol grip, with a microphone in it, and we've got the dead cat there, which keeps the wind noise to a minimum. One card and headphones. It's always a good idea to first check that you have all the items that you are meant to get, but also check that the XLR cable works and the headphones work. There's no point going onto location with a faulty piece of kit and then not being able to film something. This is the Manfrotto MV500 tripod. This is the first tripod that you will use with the Sony 70, and for most jobs it will suffice. The base plate comes off as so. There's a little screw at the side. You see that? There's a screw. We're going to undo the screw. And unlike other base plates, this one doesn't naturally slide forwards or backwards. This one lifts out, like so, okay? So let's put the camera on the tripod. To do that first, we have to put the plate on, and you're going to need a coin for this. Your debit card won't work. So, on the bottom of the camera, we have got one screw hole there. The base plate has got a screw as well. This goes into the camera. The base plate has also got lens written on it. This means that we get the base plate pointing in the correct direction. Not this way, but this way. Okay, so let's just engage the screw a little bit. So we've got a choice. The base plate could go here, or the base plate could go here. I wouldn't put it anywhere near there, because if we put it here, we can't get the battery in. If we put it here, you can't get your hand on the focus. So we want to make sure that it's clear of both of these things. These are long base plates, so there's really only one place it can go, which is just about there. You can get to the ring, and we can get the battery in. But more to the point, you can press the battery release for later on to get the battery back out. So let's tighten this up. Nice and tight. Let's see if we can get the battery on now. So now we've got the tripod. Let's put it up. I find, if you kneel down, and then you can stay out of everybody else's way and just undo the bottom latches, because then with one hand, got the tripod up to the first level. Then, that means the next adjustment, our controls are not at the bottom, we don't have to bend down. And then, again, with one hand, you can bring the tripod up to approximately where you need. Again, locking with your free hand. That way you don't need two people to do this. Let's say we want to make a, another small adjustment we can use 
there is this adjustment here and then we can use the last lift section which will then go up and we can lock that. If for any reason we want to spread the legs quite a bit wider, you've got this control here. If you press this, this will allow the tripod legs to come out. But in reality, you only ever want to do this when you want to get the tripod very low. So you wouldn't normally use this for very much. So let's put the camera on the tripod. We need to undo the, the screw. push this down, then the camera goes in at an angle and then flops down flat. Then we do the screw back up until it bites. You know it's bit because nothing is going anywhere. Now let's set the pan bar up. The pan bar's probably been sitting down here because that's the only way it can get into the tripod bag, but we want it out here so you can operate the camera and pan properly. So we've set the level that we quite like, or the angle, tighten it up, again, nice and tight. And then that way, we can then pan the camera backwards and forwards as we need. The two main controls on the tripod are the tilt lock, which is here, and the pan lock, which is here. If you find you tighten both of these up and the head is still rattling ever so slightly from side to side, it's because these screws, of which there are three, have probably come loose. If that happens, go to the store and ask Ollie to tighten them up for you. Or if you happen to have a small screwdriver yourself, you can do that. So to level the camera, we use the adjustment at the bottom underneath the tripod there. We undo that, hold on to the camera nice and tight and then we can set the adjustment. It's always a good idea to get this bubble in the middle of the ring because if you don't and you decide to pan across your landscape or to follow your actor across the stage, you will end up with a wonky pan if the camera is not level from the start. To turn the camera on, we just open up the LCD panel here. If you did want to turn the camera off whilst the LCD is open, there's an on-off switch here. We open up this little flap here. The SD card can go in either of the two slots. For some reason, I always put it in the front one. And it gets pushed in until the spring catches it. Then we then just need to close the flap. The next thing that we always must do is format the card. So we need to press the menu button which is just underneath the LCD screen hinge. OK, to format the card, we're going to press the menu. And then here, this then gives us all sorts of choices. So we've got camera settings. And then using our little control on the back of the camera, we can go down to record settings, audio settings, LCD display settings, timecode settings, networking settings, and little symbol that looks like drawers or a chest of drawers, which is known as others. And then this is where pretty much everything else is kept. So to format, we are going to need to stay on others. And by using the little uh, nubbin on the back, we can go right and we can come down quite a long way to media format. Press that button in, then that takes us to the choice of memory card A. If we had two cards, we could go from A to B, but in this case, we're just on A. Press in and then we then gives us another chance not to delete everything on the card, but in this case we do want to format because a format will delete everything we have already. Then we go press left and go OK. Now the reason that we want to format the card before we start our project is that the AVCHD format that we use is, to be honest, it's a bit of a pain to actually split these shots up in anything other than an editing package like Premiere. So it's quite hard to drag and drop any of these separate shots off. So the last thing you want to do is whenever you start your own project is to have to import somebody else's footage from the day before or even two days before. So always format your card when you're done. 
It also counts if it's your own project. If you've imported the footage from yesterday, you don't want to re-import it the next day. So always format your cards before you start. Starting from the front, we have got one ring. Some cameras will have two rings for focus and zoom. Some will have three rings, focus, zoom and iris. This camera just has one. We can choose whether to use it as a zoom ring or a focus ring here. I normally leave it on focus because then we can operate the zoom from other controls. Below, we've got the auto focus and manual focus button. And below that, we have got the selection wheel, which we can use to change the iris, the gain and the shutter speed. So I'll demonstrate. Iris is going down. Can you see there's more light going in? Then we go to gain, single tap. And again, I can increase the gain and I can take it back down. Then for shutter speed, I can do the same. I can, op I can adjust that up and down. One thing to be careful of is if you go back to iris or gain, if you double tap these, then you can see we get a little A there. That means that's back on auto, so you've lost your manual control, which for the most part, you don't want to do. To put that back, we need to press it again, and now it's got the little highlight block. Now we've got manual control. Again, if I go to gain, again, manual control, up and down, but if I tap it again, then we've got A for auto, which again, is not what you want. I've got a black background here, and now the camera's trying to make it look gray. So again, we want to tap that back, readjust it back down to a normal value, and then back to iris, we'll leave it there. So moving along to the side of the camera, going backwards, we have got the thumbnail setting. We press this if we want to uh, look at the shots that we've just done. Uh, we've got our on and off button here. We have got the display. This turns off the numeric values uh, in the LCD screen if we find those distracting whilst we're recording the shot. Here we've got the white balance. Here we can access our A and B presets, but also we can uh, access any manual setting that we've put in the camera during the, with the menu. Uh, now we've got the picture profile. These are baked in looks, which once you've learned a little bit more about the camera, you can decide if you want the image to be more saturated or more contrasty, but generally you leave this one off whilst you're starting out. Here we've got these buttons, last scene review, status check, but more importantly, they are numbered one and two. I would use these as assignable buttons, and I, my personal preference is I will put uh, focus peaking and zebra patterns on those, but that's up to you. Now, quite importantly, at the bottom here, we have got this little flap, and that is our headphone jack. So if you're actually recording sound whilst you're filming, you really should be monitoring the sound, and you do that by plugging in a set of headphones. Last but not least, we've seen this before, we have got our little slot for putting our cards in. Let's now go to the back of the camera. A very important switch there, auto manual. If you're just starting off, really, I would actually pop the camera on auto, but then once you have started filming and you get to know the camera better, then you should be on manual, and you can start using the controls that we mentioned earlier, like the iris, the gain, and the shutter speed. Uh, below here, we have got the ND filters. These are basically very, very useful devices that uh, enable us to cut back the amount of light that is going in to the camera. Imagine a pair of sunglasses going on. Number one is a small pair of sunglasses, number two is two pairs of sunglasses, and number three is three pairs of sunglasses. Very useful on very, very bright days. Okay, make sure that when you do get the camera from the store, that if you're filming inside the studio and somebody's already been filming outside, if your ND filter is on high, then your camera's gonna struggle to get enough light and you're probably gonna get noisy images. So make sure it's clear, okay? So moving on here, we have got the battery, which slips in and out. Uh, on the top here, we've got the viewfinder. If you actually want to operate with this, you can use the viewfinder, though unless it's got a little cup, you are gonna struggle to really see through this. Uh, moving on to the right, we've got the SDI out. We can use this if you want to connect the camera to the OB, the outside broadcast unit, or to any of the wall boxes into Studio A or Studio B to send the camera up into the gallery. Okay, and then below that, we have then got the HDMI, this opens up, 
So we can run this into a large monitor, which is quite nice for focus. And then below here, then we have got the DC in. Now this is where we can run the camera with a main supply without the battery, but also if you take the camera home and you need to charge it up over night time, this is the way you do it. You plug the DCI mains cable in and you have a battery plugged in, then your battery gets charged. There is no additional battery charger in the kit. Okay. Most importantly of all, the start-stop button, the record button. There is another one on the top, which we'll look at, but this is the one that you'll most likely get to, which you'll press with your thumb, a normal recording. On the right, we've hopefully seen this before, this is our little control paddle, which we can use to go up and down and left and right, but also to press in. Getting to the, the right hand side of the camera, we've got a few things here. We've got the focus magnifier. You can press this to zoom in to help you focus. It won't actually affect what you record, but it's very good for, say, focusing in on the eyes when you're doing an interview. Uh, then we've got the um, zoom paddle here. You press the forwards to zoom in. You can press the back to then widen back out. Here we've got the iris push auto, which I never use. But what we have got here is the digital extender. Now I don't use this very often, but occasionally you might get a camera from the store and you wonder why is my camera not got a wide angle anymore? Why is everything really zoomed in? And it's because somebody has left this pressed in and it gives you an artificially close up version. And there's a slight degradation in the image as well. Now looking at the top of the camera, if we go from the front, we've got a hot shoe here. You could put a Rode mic on here, but normally you wouldn't want to do that. But you can use that to put maybe a little LED light or a pag light on the front. Uh, further back, we've now got a little um, zoom paddle here. This replicates what was on the side of the camera. Again, you can paddle this up down here. You can also change the sort of the rate that the zoom works by flicking this little switch backwards and forwards, which is a fixed rate or the variable rate, or you can just turn it off. So if it doesn't actually work, it's because this is set off here. Put this back. We've got an additional fire button there, another little red dot. But again, if this little switch is flicked back, again, it's not going to work. So if your top button's not working, it's because this is flicked back. Um, here we have got a 3 8 inch screw. Uh, I have been known to actually attach a monopod to this so you can actually get a low angle dog's eye view shot of the world walking along with it. It's also just it's another mounting point or you can mount in some other fixings to maybe put a, a larger LED light on as well here. Uh, here we have got a microphone, uh, what would we call this Mark? Mount. Microphone mount here, which you can put your microphone in. Okay, at the front of the camera, at the side, we've got the audio control panel with a snazzy little Perspex cover. Okay, be careful with this. These are known to break. Uh, so starting from the left, we have got record channel select. So if we have that on channel one and two, even if we only plug one XLR mic in, it will go onto both tracks. This is pretty useful because if you're in a noisy situation or a situation where it's going to become noisy but then quiet and you don't really have the time or the ability to ride the volume controls, you can set your left hand channel a little bit lower and your right hand channel a little bit higher because when you get to your edit system, you will probably use one channel or the other, or you can use a blend of the channels. But that way you can then go from the lower channel to the higher channel, depending on whether your sound peaks or not. Okay, or you can just set this down to channel one and you can just record into one channel if that's what you want. Uh, above here, we've got the attenuation panel, which has got zero, 10, 20 dBs. Uh, certainly you can click these down. If you're in a very, very noisy setting, you might be able to go from 10 to 20 dBs. Even though you think you're adding, you're not, you're actually subtracting sound. Normal situations, you're going to be in zero. Okay, then for each one of these mics, so again, we've got control for the left hand and the right hand, we have got the line, mic, and mic 48. Line is if you've plugged in an XLR in from say a recording desk at a gig or something. And then we've got a microphone for a mic that has its own power, 
like a radio mic, and then we've got mic and 48, which is you've got a mic that needs powering from the battery. It's very common to plug your mic in and wonder why you've not got any sound. It's most probably because your mic needs powering and you're not on phantom power. I normally, for most shooting, always just look for the green because then that you know that you're going to be okay. Okay, uh, channel left, channel right, you can have manual, you can have auto. Okay, that's pretty self-explanatory. If you're on manual, this will control the volume. Same on this side as well. If you're on auto, it will do it for you. Uh, again, different circumstances suit if you've got the camera and it's not a manned camera and you're filming an event and you're not going to get to the camera, you might as well leave it on auto because there'll be some kind of constant chatter. It's only a problem staying on auto if things go really quiet because then the camera will then raise the noise floor and you'll get quite a hiss. And then as soon as somebody walks on and yells, then that then peaks too quickly because the camera doesn't know what to do. But for many situations, an unmanned camera and auto will work fine. Uh, lastly, over here, we have got the low cut filter. This tends to cut away the lower frequencies like noise and rumbles and lifts in the background. Uh, I generally leave this off because you can fix all of that in your editing package like Premiere. Anyway, it's quite easy. I would rather not mess around with the sound at the source here. Uh, when you have set everything up, you can always put the flap down to stop prying little fingers from coming in and mucking up your settings, but you can just about tweak these from the bottom if you're quite nimble. Just a reminder, the microphone that comes with this camera does need power, so make sure that you leave it on the green for the included microphone. And lastly, if you just use the internal mic, which is sort of built into here, these settings won't control that at all, then that's just an automatic. Uh, the other side of the audio panel, we've got the XLR inputs here, which are just covered with these flaps, so we can just pick these off like this. Uh, pretty straightforward, your XLR cable goes in. I normally start in at number one, and that just flicks in like that. When you want to get the XLR back out, you just have to press this little doodad down there, like this. Uh, always a good idea to check your XLRs. If you do have a bit of a buzz, there's a possibility that your XLR cable could be faulty. They do get stepped on, they do get smashed up. So you need to check those again before you go out on location. Uh, on the top here, we've got a microphone holder. This has got a little spring clip, and then this can then release, and then the microphone holder opens up, and then we can put a mic in here. Now, unfortunately, the mics that we've got don't fit perfectly, so you need to ask Ollie if he has got a little uh, a little spacer that will go in, and if not, uh, I would just get a little piece of foam or some bubble wrap and put that in, and that will stop this from wobbling around. This is useful sometimes because these mics are directional, and if you are just running around and doing a vox pop and you're on your own and you don't have somebody else to hold the mic, or you can't get your subject to hold the mic, this is a useful way of just getting the sound from the forwards. One last note, this whole connection piece here is strong but will break and I have seen these break particularly when people put the camera down roughly or don't pack it in the bag properly so do be careful with these. Always start with input one because then your channels one and two setup will be right. Here's a typical LCD setup for manual shooting so starting from the top left we have got a battery icon here nice full battery 82%. Uh, then down here we've got the codec. We're using AVCHD, which is standard for the cameras with the cards we have. If you can get some faster cards, you can record XAVC, which is slightly higher quality. And then our recording format here is 1080 25p FX. Again, this is the highest level that we can use with our normal cards. Uh, going further down here, we've got some little optional things. You've got your zebra pattern indicator, that's 75%, that's my personal favourite. We've got peaking, that shows that your uh, focus aid peaking is on. Down here, you've got the little hand here. This is steady shot. Uh, steady shot is quite handy if you're going handheld, but if you're not and you're locked off on a tripod, I would suspect that you go in the menu and turn that off because otherwise you're not using all of the pixels and your picture is slightly degraded. Uh, then we have got our F for focus here. If I actually adjust the ring, 
you can see these um, numbers changing. We've got our infinity there, and then we got our minimum focus there. So you can just know that you're on manual focus, you're not on autofocus. Here you've got your picture profile for, now this can be anything or it can normally be turned off, but this is how it sees. Uh, then we will remember this, we have got our iris setting, again, which we can turn up and down. We have got our dB and we have got our shutter speed there. Uh, I'm just gonna show you something. If I put the camera onto auto, all of these settings will then change. Now the camera decides it wants to do something else, it puts peaking on, but also can you see it's brightened it up because it saw a black background and thought I don't like this. Also it has now lost our uh, 50 um, frames per second and put this onto auto of 25. See A, A, A. That's fine if you're starting out, you're not really sure how to use a camera, but once you get going you really don't want to be on auto. So I'm going to put this back onto manual, okay. Now our black curtain's a black curtain again. Can you see we have got some audio settings there? This is just listening to my voice and this is using the internal mic on the camera. But again, when you're setting your audio levels, you don't really want these to go into the red. This is on auto, so this is why it's mostly not going into the red. Down below here, we have got our color temperature setting. At the moment, we've got a preset in the menu, which is currently at daylight, that is the sun. Moving further up here, we have now got the minutes. Oh, our lamp blue. We've got our, it's going again. We have got our minutes available on the card. These cards are excellent. You get tons of time off them at very high quality. And then here's your time code. We're not running a time code at the moment. You could have it running all the time. What do we call that when it's running? Yeah. So the free run is where it's running all the time. And here, this funny little N, this is your near field communication. This will enable you to set up the camera to wirelessly connect to your phone so you can see, is it see the image through the um, yeah, actual phone? Monitoring and, and recording. So you can monitoring uh, and record from your phone. Right, let's set up our um, shooting codec. This is very important because you don't know what the other user previous to you has set up. So in the menu, we then go to our little arrows, which is record set. We go to this first, and then we've got the choice here. If I press my button in, AVC HD or XAVC HD. AVC HD is what you will normally be shooting on because this is what the cards support. If you can get some faster cards, you can get to XAV HD. The difference between these two is XAV HD is 50 megabytes a second, which is considered the minimum data rate for BBC productions. AVC HD is the maximum of 35 megabits per second. Also, XAVC HD is 422 color space, and AVC HD is 420 color space. If you'd like to know more about the difference between these two color spaces, I suggest you Google that. Let's go back here to AVC HD, which is what we're going to be shooting on now. Now we're going to go down to record format. It's very important that you check this as well because we've got a whole choice of stuff here. Uh, the top one is 50 frames per second, not what we normally want, but if you want to do some slow motion at full HD, this is where you want to be. Now our next section's down. This is 50i. This is interlace. Once again, I would Google that if you want to find out what the difference is, but really normally you're going to be shooting on 1080, 25p FX. FX is the maximum data rate we can use on these cards, which is 35 megabits per second. If you're less concerned about quality, though it still looks very good, you can shoot at 1080, 25p at FH. That's 25 uh, megabytes per second. It means your cards will last a little bit longer and your files are a bit smaller. Uh, this is nice. You can also shoot HD at 50p in here at FX but then this is shooting at 720, which is a slightly smaller pixel size, which means you need to zoom in a little bit on Premiere. It's still very good quality, but I personally, if you want to do um, slow-mo, I would take it up to the top here, so at least it's a 1080 size picture. But for normal shooting, you want to be on 1080, 25p, FX, which is 35 megabits a second. So let's come out of there. Nothing else you really need to know on here. Simultaneous record can be off, proxy record setting. 
You can have this on if you want, but it, that means you just get two different files. You get a big file and a small file. But more often than not, you want to preserve uh, your as much data as you can on the cards. You don't want to get ripped through your cards too quickly. So there you are, ready to go. Now we want to record properly through an XLR cable. We've plugged our XLR into channel one, but we've still not got any sound because there's nothing coming up through the, um, the meters there. So we're going to press menu, find out what's going on, go back over to audio. We're going to go to mic select. We happen to be on stereo mini mic. That's not what we want. We want to be on MI shoe mic. Press this in, okay, and then we can get out of here. Now we've got our meters. This is great. Our meters are working here. Now, at the moment, we are just recording on one uh, channel at the moment, channel one. But if we flick our channel uh, select from channel one to channel one, two on the control panel on the side, now we're recording on two channels. This is working fine. This is all completely set um, to manual. And as you can see, as I'm talking, it's far too loud. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring down both of the channels until my voice really doesn't hit the red at all because we just don't want that. We don't want that to peak, okay? Now, if you're not quite sure of the surroundings that you have, because this is not a stereo channel, this is just mono going onto two separate channels, you can record your left channel quite a bit lower and your right channel quite a bit higher. So then now you can see that if I start talking rather quietly, just like this, my top, my bottom channel here is still giving quite a healthy signal. But if I start talking like this, the bottom channel is going to peak, but it does mean that then my top channel is in the clear. So this is a way of getting um, two safe audio tracks that you use at different time and you mix in from one to the other in Premiere. Let's check our white balance now. If we press the little white balance button on the side of the camera, this brings up a little icon. It happens to be set for a light bulb, which means that we are set for tungsten lighting, which is good because Studio A and Studio B are predominantly set with tungsten lights. But if we use the little roller wheel next to the menu button, we can then go to A and B. Now these are presets that somebody's already put in by using a gray card or a white sheet of paper and making a white balance that way. But we're not going to do that. We're going to just use the preset because that's the simplest way to get going. So let's press the menu button and then navigate over and then we can see we've got the white balance preset. So it is already set indoors. So the lighting, the image is neutral because the lights and the camera are kind of matching each other. If I then change this to outdoor, what happens is the image then warms up. This is because outdoor lighting is generally considered to be cooler. On the Kelvin scale, it's an average of 5,600 Kelvin, whereas indoor lighting, tungsten lighting, because it was called that because the tungsten lights were what we used to use, that is quite accurately down to about 3,200 Kelvin, which is a warmer color balance. So if we move the, um, the setting of the camera back to outdoor, the camera thinks it's outdoors and it finds the indoor lighting a bit warm. And if we go back to indoor, then the camera knows it's under the tungsten lighting, which means the lighting becomes white again and becomes more neutral. There's another option that we have is that we can go to manual white balance temperature. So we'll set that and then now we will actually set that temperature by scrolling down a couple more white balance temperature. Now you can have this at 5600, which again is approximately what daylight is. Though daylight is a bit of a mixed bag, sunset, sunrise, it could be quite warm, overcast, it could be quite cool. If you're actually in shadow, but it's a blue sort of sunny day with blue sky, then that skylight is very blue as well. But what you could do is you could split the difference. This is sometimes quite useful. So we set this at 4,400, which is between 5,600 and 3,200. Let's say you're working indoors and you've got 
light from outside coming in through the window, but the lights you've got inside are maybe standard lamps or redheads and they're uncorrected, they're all a bit warm, you might as well be somewhere between the two because then in Premiere or Da Vinci, then you are not too far from one side or the other and it's just easier to grade the correction. It's also useful if maybe you were walking with the camera from inside a warm lit building to outside. Again, it's just splitting the difference. So, but I'm now going to, well, I'm going to leave this where it is because I'm not going to set this. I'm going to go back and reset our temperature to the preset of indoors because now I know the camera is set to the warm lighting that we have in Studio B. Just want to show you uh, a couple of other items on the menu which uh, for a bit of homework you could do with looking into yourself. So if we go to the camera settings here, uh, I would always uh, recommend that our steady shot don't just have that left on. If your camera is on a tripod, you don't need steady shoot because it pushes in and it loses a little bit of quality. So I would actually turn that off. Um, let's go in down to now your LCD set. We have got the histogram, which is an exposure aid. You've got the zebra, which is another exposure aid. They're both very useful. You've got your peaking, that is a focusing aid as well. And those are the three things that I use quite a lot. So thank you for watching this tutorial. Hopefully it's been of some use to you. There'll be a short test uh, on SIZO to fill in, and once you've completed this, then you can take the camera out. If you get the questions wrong, I'm afraid you'll have to watch the tutorial again. Thank you. Bye-bye.